Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, another episode of the Pressing Forward podcast. And today I'm fortunate enough to be sitting with Aaron Snyder from uh, Tracer Tactical. He's also a United States Marine, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to steal some of this busy man's time. So, Aaron, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm well. I uh, it's a l- little later in the evening. Kids are all uh, racked out, and uh, you know, hopefully over on the the west coast, you got the same thing. Yep, yep. Kids are in bed. It's quiet. Yeah, that's uh. <laughs> see, I, I I always get it where like I'll get uh you know even as it being like ten thirty by me uh you know I'll I'll hear the creaks in the floorboards as they come down the mm-hmm. stairs and they'll like stare at me from across the other side of the computer screen. I'm like what do you want like you know you're <laughs> they're little fuckers dude but good like good kids uh, how, how, how many kids i've got a a, a five-year-old that's like about to turn six uh a four-year-old and a one-year-old so i got i got a yep, trio you're right you're right in it too so i got an eight-year-old son a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old daughter oh yeah there you go so it's like i i think the uh i wish i would have had the boy first but i mean beggars can't be choosers <laughs> at least i got the boy i know plenty of uh plenty of dudes out there that are stuck with that infantryman's curse where it's just all, all girls. girls all yeah. girls so yeah uh our our boy was definitely the craziest uh you know, he was the only one that would climb out of his crib and just, he's just a little ball of energy. So yeah, uh, having the the boy first and then the two girls, it was like a breath of, you know, we got, we got to kind of sigh uh, relief a little bit because it was, uh, it was, but it was like jumping into the deep end, obviously with our first kid and uh, how crazy it was. Oh just, yeah. That's a, that, that, I was I younger, think, you know, but not that much younger. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's one thing, like, no matter what, I was just one of one of my buddies, actually, we, we served together and um, saw him over the weekend, they're having their first kid. And I was like, dude, you're never going to be as ready as you are now. Like, you could have all the money in the world. Um, but the biggest thing is like you have a family that supports you and you got people in your life that love you, you know, like you're not doing it on, on your own. So I think yeah. that's one of the the biggest things when it comes to raising a family, they always say it, it takes a village and that is the honest truth. Yeah. We're very lucky in that both my family and my wife's family are like four miles away. There you go. Like that's... We're, we are super close to like almost everybody within our family yeah and that our brothers that... are my wife's sisters and my brother-in-laws my brothers my sisters um, um i come from a, a pretty large family i'm the oldest of six and then my parents adopted two more um so uh, my youngest sister was born not the adopted ones but my youngest like actual sister was born while i was still active duty and i was 21 years old no shit that's <laughs> your parents are uh well we don't we don't need to go there that's yeah. that's wild though that's but wild. I was, my mom had me when i was when she was 20 so okay. so yeah so she started at 20 i and kept having kids till 41 that's actually not that uh like my aunt and uncle didn't have their first kid till they were fucking 41 but uh yeah. that's uh where, where did you guys grow up at uh so i'm i'm still in southern california um, I grew up in Whittier and we moved to La Habra when, well, my parents moved to La Habra Heights when I was going into high school. So I've been here pretty much my whole life. I lived in DC for two years when I was with eighth and I, but, you know, West coast Marine, you know, went to San Diego MCRD and then, um, Camp Pendleton for SOI. Yeah. And then I got stationed back at Pendleton. So I did two years at eight to nine DC, two years with one five out of Pendleton. Nice. And and is that your, uh, is that like pretty much the, I guess we can dive a little deeper into it, but is that your extent of the Marine Corps? You just did, did you just do one enlistment and got out? Yep. Okay. Yep. So it was, you, it was I almost week. extended. I, we can, we can kind of get into that if you want, but I almost extended for 18 months, uh, one five had just gotten back from Iraq. They were this that was OIF three. So they they went to Iraq in it was early 2005. So like Battle of Fallujah. Like, yeah, because it was, that, that like, was like the second Battle of Fallujah started in like November of 
2004 so that yep. and that followed through yeah that followed up through 2005 yep it was it was like we had some of the advanced party leaving around that time i joined one five in december of 2004 that's when i so i left eighth and i in october end of october i had 30 days of leave that's when i started dating oh, my now wife and then i joined one five joined up with one five as a corporal and so well, like a, okay okay we let's let's uh i, I do <laughs> want to get into that because that's that's pretty wild right there that's like uh you know and you're not going to you know mojave viper getting to do like a workup with these guys they're like you know hey you're going to fucking iraq um so when when, when was it that you joined the marine corps so i enlisted in december of 2001 Okay, shit. So, and then I didn't go to. There were so many people joining the Marine Corps at that time. I yeah. didn't leave for boot camp until May of 2002. So I was in the delayed entry program for six months. Went through boot camp in May of 2002. I had just turned 19, and graduated boot camp in August of 2002. Okay, so, so. August 2002 finished up boot camp. You're a West Coast uh, Hollywood Marine. I am as well. Uh, you go to SOI, like you knew you were going to be a grunt. That was like the, you, mm -hmm. I, I feel like at that time, I know a lot of my, my buddies, brothers, older brothers, friends, they were all like, you know, 2001, 2002 graduating from high school. And they were all infantry Marines. Mm -hmm. like every single one of them just joined the Marine Corps infantry. And, uh, you know, I feel like that was a, you know, a notable thing to do like, like everybody had done it um back in that time a majority of the guys yeah. in high school graduating around that those couple of years 01 02 03 they all just either joined the marine corps or the army infantry yep i enlisted 03 open contract so now, when, when you went to soi did you have uh did you end up being an 11 where you just sent 03 11 yep so i got to there was a everyone got a wish list right you write down like your top three picks and i picked 0311 was my first pick i don't even remember what i picked second or third like i just i don't even remember what i wrote yeah down. i, I, just I, knew I don't that know i wanted to be an 11 and everyone was like all the instructors were like if you write down 0311 chances are you're probably going to be an 0311 you know and there was there were a lot of guys that didn't want to be 0311s that ended up being 0311s yeah so i think I don't know. I don't know what the percentage was, but uh, a large percentage of my class was 0311s. But we also had. I, didn't they do away with 52 gunners? Uh, no, I, oh, no, they 51s. went. They they went away with 51s recently. So like assault yeah. men's. I, I don't know what the idea was behind that. But what's funny, we being in a. I was a third LER, so I was a light armored reconnaissance in 29 Palms, and we had gotten. Uh, uh, a 51 sent to us and we weren't like TO'd for 0351s. Um, and the kid just, it was like, well, he went, he was supposed to go to one seven. Some reason he ended up coming to third LAR and they just kept him as unfortunate as that is the poor kid. Um, but yeah, I got rid of 0351. I don't know why they did yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, we had, it was a pretty diverse class. I mean, we all had, we had every MOS. I don't know like what they're, what, it, I mean, what if they do it differently depending on what the needs are but uh we had all the 41s 31s you know everyone was doing different things uh one of my buddies from high school actually enlisted with uh, on the buddy program he went through all of the 0311 course and then he got a chance to basically we all left and then he got a chance to go through the lav school Oh, okay yeah so yeah. so he be, he became an lav crewman so yeah he i did all the 0311 training and then then that yeah and no, that's i had we separated yeah that's how all the crewmen they get like the, i think they asked a bunch of people do you have like a driver's license or some shit <laughs> and everybody that like raised their hand i remember uh my cousin was like he was a marine prior and he's like dude don't volunteer for shit so I remember when they asked people who who's got a driver's license, I just kept my hand down. They picked like 10 kids, sent them to go be 0313 LAV crewman. And it's like, yeah. thank God. I mean, I was with LAR, but I was an 11, so I didn't have to get stuck, um, you know, either driving or running the gun, which yeah. running the 25, that's a fucking sweet job, though. Once you once you get to that position and like you're able to get rocking and rolling with a 25 millimeter chain gun, it's uh, pretty <laughs> sweet, dude. Not going to lie. I can imagine. Um, 
but uh, so you, you go through ITB and how does it, how does it end up that you get sent to eighth and I? Um, so during boot camp, they did a screening while we were going through like the, the, you know, the training up at Pendleton, we were doing all the, um, what do they call it? Going up North. They uh oh the, when you're when you're in boot camp doing the uh field week or not field yeah week, like yeah it's whatever it's, uh, it's when you're it's when your entire platoon moves up to um Pendleton Pendleton and we're yeah. up there so we're in one of the barracks at Pendleton and they call they're like if you're an O three and you're taller than six foot go down to the the squad bay or whatever the the uh, squad bay downstairs so we go downstairs. I was like, this is weird. If you're like, like, what does height have to do with this? Yeah. You know? So I go down there and I'm, you know, six, one, six, two. And I go down there and they show us this, they all cram us in there, all infantry MOSs, and they put on a little TV. They have like this crappy TV and it shows like the Marine barracks dudes marching in their blues and drilling with rifles and stuff and the marine corps commercial that i saw was that guy fighting the lava monster yes you know what I mean? yeah, climbing yeah, up yeah. the rocks and at the end he like pulls the sword and he like yeah, like in front the, of him. yeah. those are the marine commercials that i remember i didn't know what the hell eighth and i was or that the marine corps had an honor guard there was none of this like drill the the you know the guys that do the funerals at arlington cemetery all the parades um i didn't know any of that stuff i didn't know it existed right so they show us this video then they hand us this paper and it was like write down your basic information it was a screening it was write down like anything any convictions you've ever had any, if you've ever been arrested because you have to have a uh, a secret clearance to be able to work there because you're you're doing dignitary arrivals and you're doing stuff at the white house and at the pentagon and right. you know you're around a, a lot of important people and so they want to make sure that you're not a psycho right, right. so <laughs> Or, or, or someone like a connected like, to a terrorist organization. Yeah, or that's something. going through yeah. the Marine Corps, you know. Yeah. So they they screen you all over again. I had to get an FBI background check while I was in DC and stuff. But so it's a screening. I wrote down like everything that I'd ever done bad, every run in with the police because I grew up skateboarding. I'd been arrested several times, you know, trespassing from through skateboarding. Nothing serious, you know. I've, ne I've never been. I've never been convicted of a felony or anything like that. But yeah, I'd been arrested for trespassing. It's for skateboarding. You're like shen or, shen or, shenanigans, dude. Just fucking yeah, like just kid stuff. We've re you know we used to skateboard at like places at night and then run from cops and stuff. Like there was that was a normal like Friday night for me. Yeah, you know, definitely. High school. <laughs> <laughs> so every little run in I had done bad. Every little thing I had done bad, I wrote down on the screening. And, uh, and then that was it. And it was like, we were down there for 20 minutes and then it was back to normal. And I was like, that was weird. You know? So I didn't hear it. I didn't know anything about it until after I graduated SOI. And the thing that just absolutely was like, someone pulled the rug out from underneath me was the reason why I joined the Marine Corps was because I wanted to do uh, I wanted to be a scout sniper or I wanted to do recon or both. I wanted to go that route. Um, I was a strong swimmer in high school. I was on the swim team, grew up surfing, comfortable in the ocean, scuba certified, you know, all this stuff. I, I originally wanted to be a SEAL when I was in high school. And then I, when September 11th happened, everything changed. Like I just wanted to get, I just, I couldn't concentrate in college. I dropped out of college. Well, I finished my first semester of college. Man, I didn't dude, we we, sk we skip so much shit. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, that that's why I joined. I don't want to like, I do I do get into this quite a lot. Like, if you want to hear some details about this story, like the origins of what drew me to the military, I do talk about that in Iron the Iron Sights podcast that I recently did. Yeah, I saw that. So I go into detail about it, why I joined the military and what I, you know, grew up doing as a kid and stuff like that. But as far as like the Marine Corps goes, uh, 
during SOI, I'd passed the recon in doc. I talked to the first sergeant and the lieutenant there, and they had reviewed my SRB and they had my they had my SRB. They were like, you're coming to 1-1, one, one. you're going to the RIP platoon after SOI. So they had my stuff. And then I guess it got changed. It was almost like everyone that had passed the recon in doc except one guy that was like five four. Went to eighth and I. Everyone that passed the recon in doc went to it went to eighth and I because we were all part of that we were all in that screening when we went through boot camp together so all these guys get get sent to eighth and i i'm they're like calling our names at the end of soi and i find out i'm going to washington dc never been to the east coast before didn't know what eighth and i was i knew that it was freaking cold over in washington dc it was like i was leaving at the end of november Growing up, Cali kid, you know, not experiencing snow or any any sort of like weather at all. You're, you're really. like, what's what what? It's getting below fifty <laughs> degrees, dude. Like, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So, I mean, and, and as a nineteen year old kid, it was it was tough. You yeah. Know? I mean, had you had you done any traveling previous to this? Like, I mean, gone outside Just road of, trips like, with, with my parents yeah so you hadn't been on the loan you know, like on your own at mm-hmm. this point no yeah. yeah no so so i'd been to uh, luckily when i was a kid my parents we did a lot of vacations where we drove like through the u.s i'd never been to the east coast but i've been to like every single state i'd say west of indiana kentucky tennessee not south, not the south, like not the deep south. Yeah, but like but if I, you if you like cut it off on like the like you know not the Mississippi yeah. River, but just um, yeah. right on the other side. Of the- we, yeah, we so we drove several times to, out to visit you know friends in Indiana. Been through uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Minnesota. You know, I, as a kid, I was super into hockey, so my parents took me to Minnesota, and I went to uh, like the Hockey Hall of Fame, and we went nice. to the Mall of America, and. Uh, I'd been to, through Montana, Idaho, Colorado. We have family in Colorado. So we'd taken, we took a lot of trips out there, uh, going up and through, you know, Utah, Zion, Yellowstone, all up and down the, the West coast. And I, you know, and, and I went to Hawaii when I was in high school with my church. And so I'd been like a, yeah, a you lot of places, around. but, but I'd never been on my own on the other side of the country and like, Hey, you're stationed there now. Now you're going to be there for two years and having to adjust to that in my head. I just accomplished my, my dream, my goal, right? Like everything up until that point I had, I'd done right. And I passed the recon name. I was super easy for me. I thought I was going to be stationed at Pendleton and getting to go to all these cool schools and being close to home. I, you know, I'm 50 miles North of Pendleton. So it was just, I was just floored. Yeah. Well, and, and did you, st- were you dating your now wife at this time as well? No, 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 no. So I, I didn't, we didn't start dating until after I got orders. Back okay. Okay. Dating. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. We did. So yeah, we started talking while I was in DC. We met on MySpace. <laughs> nice. Did you <laughs> like was... Facebook wasn't even popular yet? Yeah, did you have like a picture of you like like ollieing a five stair as your profile picture or something? No, uh, we so I was actually doing a lot of filming still. I had I'd like some of my marine buddies got into it and we would like go night skating and stuff. Nice. There was a there so was you're a still shredding car. while you were in the like in Marine Corps. Yeah, and I have a and that kind of leads into my my second half of my experience. So while I was in DC um skating and i got a lot of good footage um from over when i used to uh when i was stationed there There there's a lot of good skate spots in in dc and while i was in dc it was towards the end i want to say it was 2000 oh it's 2003 2003 november is on thanksgiving day i was at a skate park and i completely dislocated my shoulder like bad came out of socket I couldn't get it back in and then I like hung my arm down and like went back into socket so 
it was like out and then it went boom and down back in when I picked up my board and I was in pain for all day, several, like probably several weeks I was in pain. And I was, after that happened, I started having subflexions all the time. I mean, and when you say subflexions, that means like it coming in and out, right? So, like the so it's thing. like when the joint does this, it slips, but oh, it doesn't come yeah. out all the way. It just kind of slips and then goes back. So mm -hmm. when that happens, all your tendons and muscles and everything that holds that all in there stretch because I'd torn it. I had a, I, I went to Bethesda and got an MRI and they said I had a, it's called a slap tear or a bank art lesion. It's basically when the tendon on the back of your shoulder that holds your bone in your, your, your shoulder in place, it was torn. So imagine, imagine a rubber band and cutting that thing like halfway through. Right, right, right. It's stretchier, right? It's, you're going to have uh, a greater chance. It creates a lot of instability, instability. So I, I was going to Bethesda, got it checked out. I was pending surgery and they still gave me orders to one five while I was pending surgery at Bethesda. And I'm, I was like, I'm going well, to go, go ahead and assume that you never got that surgery. No, I did. Oh. I, 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 yeah, I ended up getting surgery nice. uh, down um, in Mainside at Pendleton. And, uh, and that's honestly what kept me from deploying. So in my, which is very crazy when I tell people this, but I was in 0311 during OIF one, two and three, and I never deployed. No so because I got because yeah. I got because I got because I spent my first two years at eighth and I and then I dislocated my shoulder and then I went through physical therapy. I got surgery, physical therapy out. Damn, dude, that's and, the, and like knowing through that time that. Every, I mean, everybody had been deploying, you know, and like multiple times, my, my like roommate, that, yeah, when I went to one five, my roommate um, had deployed three times. Did you know, like, did you know Blake when he was in, when you guys were in the Marine Corps, did you meet him when, cause he was in one five for quite some time, Blake Flannery? No, um, we just missed each other or I think he was in, he might've been in an, we like just crossed path. Like, I think he came in, I want to say he left one five in 2003 right before i got there because that's when that's i think he went to then he go to he went to force recon i think no he did he recon. did but he went he was in one five i know he went to he did the in, invasion in in march with one five he was in fallujah with one five at some i know i think he spent like that was his first three years or four years in the Marine Corps with one five. And then the rest of it was with uh force reconnaissance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that I I've talked to him just like briefly on Instagram and we exchanged information and, you know, he told me he was with one five and we, the dates that he gave it, we like just missed, each just other. missed each other. Yeah. That's uh yeah, that's, that's uh, how weird would that been though? So I, I have, I have had people contact me from one five that, that, that they were in when I was in, but this is what was weird about my, my Marine Corps experience was that when I was at eighth and I, eighth and I is tiny. And I left eighth and I as a corporal got to the, to the fleet one five as a, as an NCO. And so when I, when I got there and I checked in, no one was like in charge of me, Obviously, I'm obviously I'm in a platoon and I they, I got assigned. They they looked at my when I checked in, the first sergeant there was like your classic Marine. I forget his name. It's been over 20 years, right? Yeah. It's close to 20 years since I checked into to one five. So um this classic looking first sergeant, huge jaw, you know, high moto, high and tight, just massive broad dude. He looks at me, he looks at my SRB, he's like, first class swimmer, you're going to Alpha Company. So Alpha Company was the boat platoon. Yeah. Even though nobody was doing boats at the time, um, they put me in with Alpha Company. So I was with Alpha Company for a very short time until basically they found out I was uh, non-deployable because of my shoulder. 
And then I got stuck with H and S for a little while. And then H and and then when everyone left, everyone that stayed back went to the dad platoon, which is the dependence assistance during deployment. All the all the broke dicks and guys that would, you know, guys that were going UA and came back and um, just, it was like, it was like 60 guys of like these, like, just. Shitbag platoon just, almost. It was like, I don't yeah, want to say, I, I don't want like. like, to say you're, it. but it was, I know, it, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's what it was. It was like all these guys that were injured, doing physical therapy, guys that were like on like, just there was a lot of shit bags i don't know like it was the worst experience ever i hated oh, it i could imagine that time. dude that's fucking coming shitty. from coming from eighth and i and i i thought i i didn't appreciate it until after i left so when i got to the fleet and i found out what it was really like that's when I realized how good I had it at eighth and I, and had so, I known what the real fleet was like, I probably would have tried to stay there. Well, explain, explain some of those differences that you saw that made you think that way. So eighth and I, you are across the street from the commandant's house. The commandant comes over and works out in the same gym that you're working out at. You're working out with the body barriers, which all those guys, all they do is eat, sleep, work out, and they train. All the training that we do is down at Quantico. So we're training with a lot of officers. The training that we do was very organized and I could say it fun. We were a heel, I was with Alpha Company. So we were a helo company. We were doing a lot of helo stuff, running into the backs of, you know, CH 47s, patrol, like with, with no helmets or anything, just straight up like. LBVs, boonie hats, you'd land in an LZ, you'd go on a patrol for, you know, six miles or whatever, navigating, and then you'd navigate to another LZ, run to the helicopter, jump in. We would do spy rigging. We would do just a lot of stuff around helos. It seems like you guys had like a more eclectic, uh, you know, training environment than a lot of fucking regular grunts did, dude. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, I took my cam, I got, I've got camera footage of me. I'm at the bottom of the line during spy rigging and I filmed the whole thing. I film, I should post it. I got video. It's like crappy like old, old school, like crazy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. An eight millimeter camera. And I filmed the whole thing, just us flying over Quantico. Um, but it was good stuff. I got to go to Sear school. You know, as a Lance Corporal, I grunt, which a lot of grunts don't get to go to SEER school. Yeah, I don't know a single grunt that's been to SEER school, unless maybe like some scout snipers or something. But I, yep. that's so we went to I went to the inaugural class, which was in Bridgeport. So we flew to the West Coast and it was just me and my roommate because eighth and I gets billets for these um, courses. So I had guys in my platoon that had been through jump school. And guys in my platoon that had been through ranger school, oddly enough. Yeah. Like Marines get getting to go. Yeah, to no, th- th- there's like every branch. I think every branch gets the ability to send dudes to ranger school. Like that's one of those weird things that mm-hmm. like, randomly there'll be a couple people in. Yeah. So it, it was like we got all these really cool opportunities and we did like the night vision course at Quantico, which apparently Quantico has the second largest night indoor night vision course in the world. It was like a night vision obstacle course hmm. going over and we were putting on the PVS sevens, you know? Yeah. Like the single so, monocular, but like it's got the, the binos, but it goes to <laughs> one. Yeah. That's... It was, it was like, it was before we were even using the PVS 14s. So P- PVS sevens going over like all this uneven terrain, climbing, cargo nets chain chain ladders climbing into windows going through hallways it was like it was a massive indoor obstacle course that you go through that's in pitch black and you're wearing goggles that's pretty i've never heard of that before you know it's pretty cool yeah. that there's some you know some things out there I, i'm sure some of the high speed dudes are like uh you know cqb courses or something that they go through they do similar things but for us we would play uh 
we played football with our MVGs and Kevlar's on. Not like it w- it ended up being full contact, but we'd be in the backyard at 29 Palms trying to play catch with the football at, you know, whatever time at night. People would yeah. just be like going like this, catch it, get whacked in the face with the football, you know? <laughs> It's a good way to break your goggles. Oh, I mean, a good way to break your nose, dude. People yeah. are getting fucking whacked in the face. Yeah, those, uh, especially the PBS sevens. The PBS sevens have terrible depth perception. Yeah, you can't see. It's not like you can focus one eye to the ground and one eye, you know, out like you can with dual tubes. Yeah, well, that I I uh, I have a pair of dual tubes, but I've never used them in. I know that's embarrassing to admit, but I've never used them at the range. Like I've never gone out and trained with them. Like I've got mm-hmm. plenty of time under the PVS 14s, but I still, I keep the PVS 14s ready to rock and roll. I do not, uh, um, that that's what I'm familiar with. You know, I yeah. just have the dual tubes cause I wanted to be, you know, act like a cool guy and wear a pair of dual tubes. Yeah. It's I've done a course with Kawa, um, out at California range weekend. And it was a lot of fun just, you know, using lasers and you focus one, you, you, you focus one eye on the target and one eye at your optic. And so you can shoot through your optic, you can shoot with your vis laser, your, your IR laser. And I would, I would definitely recommend doing a night vision course while shooting. It's a lot of fun and you, you learn a lot about your weapon and how to do certain things. Um, Really fun course. I would. Yeah. I I think, I I think I know who you're talking about too. Kawa. He was, uh, he did, he was a Marine and he was army special forces, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's got some pretty cool stuff. I always want to go out and I mean, um, I'm sure people don't want to listen to us fucking BS about tactical shooting courses and shit, but I've always wanted to go out and do a lot of these, but it's like, one they're in another state you got to travel and drive or fly and it's a fucking you know 700 bucks or 500 bucks and you need a thousand rounds it's like fuck dude it's expensive it is expensive Expensive it's 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 worth it i mean to get the the ability to be competent and capable in that aspect you know it's it's worth it beyond the training that you get in your time and service but yeah um so you you culminate your Marine Corps experience after, you know, you have to do physical therapy, repair the shoulder. Um, you know, you get out. What, what's that? How, how are you feeling? You know, like, did any of the guys give you shit while you're, you're still in like at, on your way out? Like, Hey, you fucking wasted your time or, you know, you no, know, no, I didn't. So, so when everyone got back, first of all, when I was with, I know they're gone now, but when I was, when I was staying in San Mateo, I did have a room there, but I was hardly ever there because my, my parents lived 50 miles north of Pendleton. So I was driving home almost every day just to get away from Pendleton. No shit. And when I got stationed back to Pendleton, that's when I I had 30 days of leave. So I'd been talking with this girl who's now my wife where we will be married 16 years this year nice um but we started dating i knew her we went to the same high school i knew who she was because she's got a unique name but we never talked and i started i started talking to her then we started like dating and by the time i got out we'd been dating over a year and my shoulder was getting better I was living in the crack houses at the time. Those are gone now. They bulldoze those things. But if anyone during that time was in, they'll know what the crack houses were. In San but Mateo, think, you're talking about? Yeah. 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 Like they were right next to the parade deck. And then I, so I got to live in like three different, three different rooms while I was there because we kept, they kept moving us around. But when one five came back, they put them in like the, the Kwanzaa huts up at Talega. Which and was that that's like isn't that Talega's the artillery like the artillery area or is that Las Polgas I'm thinking of? You're that's Las Polgas. That's yeah, that's where our south. So Talega is north of San Mateo. It's a tiny little area. It's where they filmed Heartbreak Ridge. And 
it's also where uh, the basic reconnaissance course takes place. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So it's a tiny little area of Pendleton and it's like three miles from the chow hall. So I saw these guys who didn't have cars who were put in these Kwanzaa huts, like worse than boot camp conditions, living in living in these Kwanzaa huts with all their gear, stuff in a footlocker, sleeping in a bunk bed, a squad bay in bunk beds. When they get back, having no privacy, community bathrooms, they just got back from a, a six month deployment That's or seven crazy. month deployment. Yeah. Like in Iraq, right? Like they were just getting yeah, back. And from we Fallujah. had like 16 KIAs. Like I did a lot of the funerals. So when the guys would come back, the dad platoon would handle all the like all the arrangements and stuff with the with the dependents. So Jesus, dude. we would go do the funerals. So I would get in my blues and we would go just support the families. And it was wild. Like I had, and a lot of the guys I had met prior to them leaving. And oh, now shit. I'm at their funeral. What was that? I mean, what was that like knowing that? And I don't want, when I say this, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, obviously you're in a, in a certain situation where you're, you're not able to go and deploy like if you're capable of doing it i'm yeah. you know you would have been able to do it and then you're fuck now you're it, in that, that i that. i for many years i would say probably about three years i struggled with it big time because i had done i joined during a time of war i wanted i joined the marine infantry to go overseas and fight all the training, everything that I was doing, all my time I was spending working up to go do a job that I never got to do, right? So yeah. I struggled with that emotionally and mentally for a very long time. Looking back, obviously I feel extremely lucky um, that I don't have to deal with a lot of the things that Marines deal with when they go see combat. And there's obviously Marines have the sense of pride, you know, obviously with the, they have a combat action ribbon. I don't have one. I don't have a combat action ribbon. I was an infantry Marine that never saw combat. And when I got out of the Marine Corps, my first job out of the Marine Corps was, well, first of all, before I left the Marine Corps, I had an opportunity to extend and I wanted to take the sniper in dock, but they said, well, if you're going to take the sniper in dock, you need, to, we're not going to let, even let you take the end dock unless you extend 18 months. We're not going to waste our time. I had like six months left. And the next deployment that they were going to do was Westpac. So they're going to go to Okinawa. I mean, that's a pretty new or something. Yeah. That's yeah. a pretty cool deployment, right? Yeah. Especially after going to Iraq all these, all those times. So I thought about it, but at, this, at the same time, I'd been dating my girlfriend for about almost a year. I knew she was the one, you know, I had moved on by that time when they were telling me, Hey, you need to, we're not going to let you do the in doc unless you extend 18 months. I was like, I had to let go. I was like the Marine, the, my Marine Corps dream. I had to let that go. And so the Marine, the, you know, what I did in the Marine Corps, I never truly got to, to do. So I never got to fulfill that dream, but I also felt very lucky and having met my now wife, I just, it was clear to me the decision that I had to make. Um, and so I just chose to get out. And the first job that I, that I had when I got out was a surveillance specialist. And so I worked for a company called Horseman. We did workers' comp surveillance. It was it was all workers' comp fraud. Did that for three years. And while I was doing that, I was toying with the idea of joining the reserves. Uh, two, two, three, 223 in Southern California, they have a they have a sniper platoon. And so I called that unit up and I had, and I'm still hanging on to my Marine Corps, my little, my Marine Corps dream where I'm like, oh, yeah. it's possible, <laughs> it's possible. Like I can join the reserves. Dude, I've been out 10 years. 
I'm still oh geez yeah no. i was still uh i got out when i was 24 no i was 23 when i got out but i think at this time i was like maybe 24 25 and uh i was married at this point so i had just gotten married um i got ma- my wife and i got married after i'd been out of the marine corps like a year and then we got married but I was, you know, I'm married now, newly married. I'm telling my wife that I'm thinking about joining the reserves. Well, reserve units at the time were getting reactivated, like getting activated and deploying. Like I had friends that that happened to. I had friends that got recalled when they got out. So it's still going on. Like this is now 2007 or something. 2008. Yeah. Yeah. Because I got out in 2006. And I was still IRR until 2010. So this is like 2007, 2008. And I'm having friends that I served with get called back up and now they're deploying again. Yeah, that's shit. That's fucking crazy. I talked to a dude. Um, he joined. He was in um boot camp during 9-11 and and anyways he did his first enlistment got out got recalled went to iraq or went to afghanistan got back got out they told him see you later again gets recalled again on like this is a true story gets recalled again and then they wouldn't let him re-enlist after recalling him all these times he got called back sent away called back sent away and he had a hard time finally he ended up being able to get back in but um you know that the the that I have never known anybody that that's happened to, but at that point in time, through like the, the mid two thousands, that was happening quite often. Yeah, yeah. So that I went through a phase where I was seriously considering re you know joining the reserves and not reenlisting, but joining the reserves. Right. And it was like two thousand nine when I left that company and i started working for gavin de becker and associates nice uh gdba is a private security firm they do executive protection and that's what i i i you know left the insurance fraud investigation industry and i and i started my ep career so yeah, gavin de becker he's a he's a marine is he not no no no, no. Gavin no. is not military. Okay, for some reason I thought he. Was, oh, you know, I'm I'm thinking of uh, Eric Prince. He was a Navy SEAL, not a Marine. That's yeah. what I'm thinking of. Yeah, but GBA is made up of like 80 percent Marines. Yeah, all the leadership, especially the leadership when I was there, it was like four out of six executives were former Marines. So. Yeah. When, when I was at that contracting course that I was telling you about, like they had a recruiter, they had a guy there, like, you know, handing out business cards. They were in, you know, huge majority of the contracting guys were, you know, yeah. a lot of them were Marines as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that for 13 years. It was, uh, I mean, I was still with GDBA up until a little over a year ago. Okay, so with, with you, you had that career where you're able to like transition into, I don't want to say like utilizing the same skills, but like doing that EP, um, you know, PSD thing, uh, you're, you're still in the element of, I don't know, I don't want to say service. That's that sounds it, like silly no, it was, say it, but GBA was at, at the time that I joined, I joined in 2009. So my, my experience as a, an insurance fraud investigator was very different from my experience with Gavin De Becker and Associates. So as an insurance fraud investigator, and especially being in SoCal, you know, I'm going to work in my car with tinted windows. I'm working out of an SUV with tinted windows, and I'm wearing shorts, sandals, t-shirt to work every day. And I'm in my car and I'm following people around. I'm working on my own primarily. There's a, you know, there were cases where I would work with with another investigator, but primarily I'm working on my own. Going from that transitioning into GDBA, GDBA is a very paramilitary organization. Oh yeah, suit and tie 
suit and tie shit, dude, right? Like everywhere you go, you're buttoned up, dude, like looking fresh. Yeah. And then, so a lot of the residential details, you're wearing like jeans and flannels, you know, but when you're working an event, you're, it's suit and tie yeah. pretty much. And then even some of the, some of the details are suit and tie. Luckily I was on a lot of details that didn't require that. So I was in more relaxed clothing. So let you me, are- let me ask you this And I don't, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but like awesome. coming from that transition from the Marine Corps, like when you, when you left the Marine Corps and you started going into doing the, uh, you know, the, the workers comp fraud stuff, like mm. obviously I would assume that that didn't, I don't know, like f- scratch the itch or like fulfill the idea of like, you're, what I'm doing is not, uh, what i wish that i was doing you know well in certain in certain acts in certain aspects it did because i was doing a lot of rural cases so i was there were some cases where i would hike in at like five in the morning and i'd be in a ghillie suit all day surveying a house on a radio with another investigator who's parked a mile down the road and i'm on glass for eight hours watching a house all day seriously you went through these extents to get some guy like fucking over the state of california for some workers comp or whatever oh that's that's, hey that's dedication that's fucking dedication dude it's a huge industry and what's funny is i work cases so the cases that stand out to me like the really sketchy like rural cases where i'm in a ghillie suit or using like camo and and like propped up somewhere with, you know, a pair, like, like a spotting scope or something. Uh, I did that in cases a, a lot around Northern California. I did a case out in 29 Palms where I was laying in like the desert, just baking all day long no, with fine. a camel back on. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, I did cases out in Hawaii, Idaho. One case in Idaho, I did it in the snow. So I'm wearing snow camo. Like in the, in, I was like positioned in like this abandoned, like lumber yard or something. I was in like this lumber yard up against a fence, and I'm wearing snow camo, and I'm filming across like this creek, and I'm on a, I'm, I'm wearing cold weather gear, you know, and I'm, I'm on a radio with another investigator who's parked several blocks away, and I'm just. That's when I was like, I'm kind of getting a taste of what I wanted to do. Was it fun? Yes. I was young, but it also sucked too. There was a a suck factor there. Yeah. There's a, there's a give and take pro and con to, you know, everything that you do. But I was, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was super cool. Very different. It was not, it was not a job where I'm like working a register or dealing with customer service or hating, like just hating my life this was challenging. It was, I had to be creative. I was building all sorts of custom surveillance equipment, cameras, hidden, hidden cameras and backpacks and spotting scope attachments for my camera and camo, you know, I had all this camo gear in my car and you had to do pretexting. You had to lie basically to get into places. So with, with this, like, uh, I, I guess being able to like craft your own stuff did, did any of like the gear creation, like you sewing stuff together or creating, I mean, I guess, did you make your own ghillie suit where mm-hmm. you like, so, so all that stuff you already already had like a, a knack for, I guess like the, the gear side of things well before Tracer Tactical came along. Yeah. I learned to sew when I was a kid Gotcha. and before joining the Marine Corps, I did a lot of airsoft. Even after I got out of the Marine Corps, I kind of got into airsoft a little bit and I was playing with some local teams. That was another thing too, was I did have a little bit of an outlet of that through Airsoft. We would do these big organized games and, you know, as someone who hasn't experienced combat, it's different. I, I knew guys that were heavily into Airsoft that had experienced combat and uh, it changes you. I, I'm not going to lie. It, it, there is a different, there is a, there's a different mindset and I, it's hard to describe, but I, I can't relate. I can't relate to someone who 
has had combat. And that's part of the part of the struggle that I've had in even, you know, maintaining relationships with, you know, former Marines. It's, I don't relate to other Marines who have had combat in that way. Yeah. It's just, I don't, I didn't get that experience. So. Um, but I feel like that's, that's something that, you know, at a certain point in time, that's a, a thing that a lot of people hold on to. And I mean, mm-hmm. I did for a long time and part of me still does, but at the same time, like being in the same branch, having the same job duties, you know, like you've been through a majority of the the similar training. And the one thing that everybody allows themselves to be set apart by and create like a divide is <clears throat> whether or not you've like, you know, been in a combat zone or been mm-hmm. engaged in direct combat. And yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it up to say that like, it's not, uh, it's not important because it is, but there's so many people that allow that to create a gap between being able to build relationships because of something that like one person has or has not done. And mm-hmm. I, and, and that's part of the reason why I want to do, you know, talk to anybody and everybody about their time and services, because, you know, there, there are things that correlate and piggyback off of you know things that we've all done and show similarities in that and um you know even going to like doing airsoft and linking up with guys that had also served it gives you and i'm not trying to relate this in any way shape or form to um combat situations but it gives you like a little camaraderie in the sense of operating and coordinating as a team um right. and being able to communicate and like you know like oh let's set up a base of fire like you guys are you know like a support element you guys are you know salt element whatever it may be you're still getting um you know some good training in and also it's, it's actually pretty fun so it is especially if you play with guys who are very organized and some of the places I haven't done it in probably geez, 15 years or so, but I see some of these Milsem games that some of these oh, guys do and they insane. go to these insane, they, they go to these massive, like abandoned cities or training areas where they're in like build, like it's like a Mount town. It's like a giant Mount town. Yep. Like that would be super fun. And, and the, uh, the thing that you have to kind of remember is um, being a little bit older and I'll be 40 next month. So a lot of these kids that are playing airsoft, this is their introduction into potentially wanting to join the military or a lot of it, maybe they, maybe they don't have, maybe they just don't, have that maybe they can't maybe they would love to join the military but something's not allowing them to join the military maybe they have some sort of physical impairment or something that doesn't allow them to join but it's been their dream this and like they've had a lifelong dream of being able to serve and they never get the chance because of something that's holding them back that they have no control over right and so they find airsoft and then they look at veterans like these like they see it they see they, they it's weird in the airsoft i haven't been involved in the in in it in a long time but i remember being i remember when i was out of the marine corps freshly out of the marine corps and i was playing with these kids and they know you're a marine corps veteran and they look at you like you're a professional football player yeah no i know, I know what you're saying like you feel like they treat you almost like you're a celebrity or something because you served right yeah. and so i think it's important to not it's like if you're going to go into those situations and i think a lot of veterans should get more involved i mean i'm maybe i'm convincing myself to get more involved in it but uh i have young you know young kids when my kids are a little older and i have more time maybe it's something i pick up or something but i think i think it's good for for veterans to understand that there are there's a lot of mentor opportunities mentorship opportunities in that arena oh yeah and i know guys like travis haley and uh um i forget who else but he's he's like the only veteran like he was a force reconnaissance marine 
everyone knows who he is and he's playing airsoft games. Yeah, no, he, advo- I mean, there's guys out there that really advocate for it and not in the sense that it's giving you the same like uh, feedback in the sense of things that are coming your way um, in, in the, in the price that's paid when, you know, something bad happens, but uh, the sense of maintaining your cover and concealment and communication, um, you know, hand and arm signals, being able to like uh, get like, you know, everybody talks about CQB and like all these well-lighted areas, like understanding where you're, because a lot of guys will use, um like legit optics and legit lights oh, and yeah. shit like that so being able to see the capabilities of your gear um wearing your plate carrier wearing some sweet tracer tracer tactical scout rig or something making <laughs> sure that everything's set up to fit right while you're yep. maneuvering and everything it all plays a role into um one proficiency and two like uh um that sustainment with your kit and making sure mm-hmm. that everything's functional uh, a lot yeah. of people bash it i mean i definitely did and i have before but um you know coming around to see that those big mills milsim uh events like that definitely changed my mind into seeing like first person uh, view of like guys wearing gopros and shit of how effective it can be with applying those small unit tactics mm-hmm. and uh you know if you're going to find a group of like-minded people that, excuse me, um, shoot and everything, like you got to practice some way. You can't be using live rounds on anybody. Not everybody can afford SIM guns and fucking yeah. all the SIM rounds and everything. So airsoft or paintball is like your next best bet. Yeah. I, I would say it's an extremely effective training tool. And I know that there's been some really good videos about it, but just, maneuvering as a team, a small unit and the communications and coordinating and being able to, you know, navigate all those things that are so important outside of shooting, right? It puts you in a position, it puts you in an, uh, like in a situation to where you can start troubleshooting and, and working through and problem solving. So, you know, I, I would love to eventually get back into it maybe pick it up with my son when he's a little bit older. He's eight right now. So maybe in like eight years. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, but yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, we kind of got a little bit off topic. Yeah, definitely way off topic there, but it's, it's, it's okay. This is, it's natural. It's free flowing and that's really what it's, uh, but some good topics, some good points in in there as well. Uh, getting back to, Gavin DeBecker uh, spent 13 years at Gavin DeBecker and Associates, and um, you know I, I would assume in 13 years you were able to work yourself up to, um, you know I don't want to say prestigious, but like a, a a level that's you know beyond your entry level dude. Um, yeah. What kind of responsibilities did you have as you worked your way up through Gavin DeBecker? So I started in PSD, which is the Protective Security Division. Um, back then they were called security staff agents now they just call them like protectors but started out working for a detail then i got more involved in working several details and so i was bouncing around from detail to detail and i got my taste of working for top level executives um billionaires people who if i said the name everyone knows who they are um And then running those details and i had some some pretty good opportunities to actually utilize my training you know having trespassers on property and actually making an arrest uh three arrests and you know putting yourself in danger you know we're wearing body armor and we're carrying weapons so i'm maintaining a firearm precision uh proficiency we have physical fitness tests we do a lot of medical training i went through fax training. I went through EVOC, which is emergency emergency vehicle operators course. You learn how to do the J turns and, and all that stuff out in uh, the San, at the San Bernardino. There's an EVOC training facility. A lot of cool training fax, fax training where you learn how to evacuate uh, aircraft. You learn how to use the wet ditch equipment and you get hooked up to like a hypoxic, hypoxic machine and you're doing a test and they're taking the oxygen out of your blood and triangles start becoming amoebas and you start losing your ability to tell the difference between color and 
for some reason my math got better during that test but <laughs> that's <laughs> you know you feel like you're losing it right and then as soon as you're you're the oxygen in your blood gets to a dangerous level it, it shuts off the test shuts off and so you're left with this data that shows how long you last if the cabin were to become depressurized no shit so that's like why how, they do it yeah they teach you how to call and air traffic control and like have them basically land the plane for you yeah i was gonna say like everything short of like having to land the plane yourself mm -hmm. They basically take over a remote and they can land the plane for you. But you learn how to communicate with air traffic control. A lot of cool, cool training. And so I did that for, I think, like five or six years. And then I got an opportunity to become the director of operations for our tech division. And so our, the tech division at the time was a division that designed a full service. So we would we would do an assessment of a property or a business. And then we would design the security system, which included cameras, access control, safe room, lighting, deterrent vegetation, dogs, alarm system. So was everything. a lot of this, like when you're, when you're explaining this, was this more so for like very high end residential um, establishments? Yep. Yeah. So we're talking $50 million estates in Beverly Hills. Yeah large large properties businesses and, and would this be from the ground like if they're building a new home or like both new construction or both. you're coming in and establishing like new all new everything sometimes sometimes a client would come to us and say hey we purchased this home it's got an existing system can you guys come out take a look at it tell us what's good what's not what should we replace what should we keep all different phases. Sometimes a client would be building a home. And so we would, we would be working off of plans and we'd be working with vendors and contractors and specking all the infrastructure. Hey, make sure you get conduit from this point to this point. We're running cabling for these devices. And so we need to run these cables. And then we, when I was the operations director, we were in charge of the technicians too. So we hired on technicians and we trained them to work in these homes. And so we were doing service, we were doing large installations, you know, anywhere from a small, quick $10,000 project up to a million dollar security installation. So what's the, what's the craziest, uh, you know, obviously you can't name clients and shit, but like some layout or some, you know, how much money was it? And what was like the craziest feature that it came with? Um, one of the projects that I think was pretty high speed at the time, they were using every PTZ on the property was a thermal flare camera. And then they also would, they also installed, it's called thermal radar. And so these cameras were like $20,000 and you put them on the roofs and it's a little camera inside this little device that basically the camera is constantly spinning and it's taking these pictures and it's splicing them together on the computer software and it has built-in analytics, it's thermal. And so it sees 360 degrees and it's picking up things and it's telling you, hey, that's a car, that's a human, that's an animal. So it's relaying all this information back to the end user, the, the guard in the command center who's monitoring all this stuff. That's crazy. Um, yeah, it was some really cool, the, there were some big, big projects that I did that were very stressful and because there's a lot on the line, right? You're, you're dealing with contractors and clients who are spending a lot of money and tensions are high and things got to work, right? So this, it was a lot of pressure and I was more in the office. I would go out to the field sometimes to learn how things work and I installed my own alarm system at my house and learned a lot of it through doing it that way like just actually getting hands-on but my job as the operations director was mainly setting up procedures writing policy hiring firing just all the that's where I that's where I got the confidence to start my own business to be honest yeah let's say you're like understanding how the machine fucking works like from the inside yeah. out yeah yeah. So I was basically working, creating a startup within a company, 
because we were we started out as like four people and by the time we shut down the division there was 26 people in the division and we were increasing our revenue by like a million dollars every year so with it with the tech side of things like within mm -hmm. gavin de becker okay yep. so throughout this whole time like you've um so this is would be what you started that in 2009 you said right and you did i started i started with gavin de becker in 2009 Two and the tech division didn't start until like 2012 okay 2000, no 2013 I think. so by this point you guys already have like your first kid on the way almost it was yeah i was right so i i left psd right around when my wife got pregnant okay we waited so, seven years to have kids so we had we we did some traveling we did like a 23 day backpack trip through europe um or 27 days or something like that it was nice. close to a month but it was just you know my wife and i sleeping in hostels riding on trains i think everybody needs to experience something like that i mean i've i've never done it but i did get to go like um you know in japan and like travel around japan a little bit stay in tokyo but that was pretty yeah. cool but um you know when when you had initially said that you're you struggled for a little while when you first got out of the marine corps um you know all throughout all this stuff that you're doing you know like obviously building the stress with the responsibility and some of these big projects that you've got going on in your job right now um what are what are some of the things that um i guess you're still holding on to from your time in service and how have you dealt with managing stress or like coping mechanisms that you've used with some of the things that maybe you feel guilty about or like obviously that's traumatic like doing these funerals being a part of the you know ceremonies or being there for the families mm -hmm. um you know holding on to the fact that maybe i didn't do enough or I'm, you're maybe you're satisfied with your time in service and and getting out and like that hasn't been um you know a factor in it but how how are you dealing with some of those things then and like all these years later so I will say that the Marine Corps, I still identify as a Marine through and yeah. through. Yeah. I, I walked away from the Marine Corps with like changed, obviously it, it is still part of my fiber. Like I, it is woven into me. It is part of me. It has shaped my, my thinking my behavior joining gdba was it got me back into that kind of uh community working with a lot of marines working with other vets you know from other services and being able to see you know how different marines from different because you know when you're in the infantry you're only around pretty much infantry guys and nothing else right but Working in, in GDBA, I was around a whole lot of different guys from different backgrounds, different um, everywhere from, you know, Army infantry guys, SF guys, recon dudes, snipers, um, SEALs, guys who were just went to college and were athletes in college, um, officers that are working now right alongside me and they were an officer in the Marine Corps and I was an enlisted guy. Right. And we're doing the same thing. That's it's as a young kid, fresh out of the Marine Corps, I, you know, I joined GBA three years after I got out, but still not that long. It's weird to be working alongside someone who was an officer in the Marine Corps when you were enlisted and you're on the same level. Right. And it was one of the things that I, I still kind of like think about and is is what I tell people is it really doesn't matter what you did yesterday. What matters is what you do today and what you're going to do tomorrow. And as long as you keep that mindset of it doesn't matter what I did yesterday. Like yesterday's gone, it doesn't matter. Like today is today. Today is what matters. And so I think about that every time I wake up in the Marine Corps, you don't really think that you're 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 counting down the days, you know, to the weekend. You're you're a young kid. You're not really. As you age, obviously, you learn to like see life for what it is, and and you you appreciate things differently. But 
it wasn't until I joined GBA that I really started seeing what my potential could be because I was seeing young guys who were working really hard and advancing quickly. And I was seeing guys that had been there a long, long time doing the bare minimum and staying where they're at for years and years and years. Guys that had been with GBA for a decade and they were still like the bottom of the totem pole. So, I mean, going back to your question, I would say just some of the things that, that, I, that I struggle with or it's probably, I had to let go. I had to, I definitely had to let go of the not experiencing combat a long time ago. And it wasn't until I started finding my new purpose within GDBA that I was able to get past that. And the confidence of what, of what you do, you know, on a daily basis will change the way you feel about yourself. Um, and so, I mean, I was very success, very successful within GDBA. I, I left as a director. I was making high six figure salary, able to support my family. Um, GDBA took very good care of me and I got to experience a lot of very cool things, traveling, seeing like what's on the other side of the curtain with how the rich actually live. And we're not talking like celebrities. I saw the celebrity side too, but I'm talking like billionaires, how the, how billionaires live. And I learned a lot about that. And, and probably one of the biggest things that I learned was you could have a billion dollars and, or we're talking, you could have a hundred billion dollars. And you can still be a miserable person every day. I was just going to say, you still get money doesn't buy your happiness. That's one of the big takeaways that I learned at GDBA was money does not buy happiness. Uh, you know, working for some of these clients, I, I saw their personal lives and, and money isn't it. It's, it's not what makes you happy. I mean, these people have everything you could ever dream of. And they are still stressed. They're dealing with problems in their marriage. They're dealing with problems with their kids. It like money doesn't fix your problems. Yeah. It's uh, kind of almost enhances that shit, especially it does. when you get it. Yeah. really does, actually. It enhances your problems. It's basically money, all it does is make a more extreme version of yourself. So if you're a very giving person, naturally, you're probably going to be very giving with your money um but if you're into certain things you take like if you're a car guy you're gonna have all these crazy cars if you're you know into vacations you're gonna be traveling you're gonna be going some crazy vacations and doing some crazy things it just it enhances it enhances your it makes your life more extreme you know, you uh, go from I can I can't I can't even imagine because I don't one I don't really know any rich people <laughs> and two I am not rich myself so um, yeah but I but I but I would I remember because I I live uh, about thirty miles away from LA and I couldn't wait to get out of that bubble every day like driving into work but at the end of the day getting out of LA and just being away from all that was like I felt like I could breathe again. Yeah. So do you, do you think that Gavin DeBecker set you up for success, like working for, um, you know, I don't want to say corporate, but like a, a larger entity of a company you got out, gave you a, a purpose, kind of drove you, um, you know, monetarily set you up. And yeah. then, you know, through that time working there, you set up your, you know, Tracer Tactical while still working for GBA, right? Yeah. Well, it was, it was really COVID that allowed me to start taking advantage of that time, right? So everything went remote at that time. And so I didn't have a commute anymore. A lot of stuff shut down and I was starting to sew stuff before COVID. I actually started making little pouches in, I wanna say January of 2020. 
So January 2020, before everything shuts down, I'm starting to dabble with these little lockpick pouches. And I was into lockpicking and stuff at that time too. So I was heavily involved in my security consultant role doing assessments, but GDBA 100%, there was, there's so many valuable things that I learned from being in that in those settings. Just and, I, and it carries over just like it just like it does the, the Marine Corps. So the Marine Corps, there's a lot of things that are a lot of positive attributes that are instilled in you as a Marine, especially for kids that really weren't taught that stuff as kids. Like, like how how much appearance matters. You're taking pride in the little things that you do. You know, making your bed, um, polishing your shoes, ironing your clothes, just hygiene, all these little things that matters, uh, your, your inspections, you know, inspect what you expect, all that stuff. And, and GDBA was the same way. GDBA was very paramilitary, but just the situations of being, having to learning how to talk to these high level executives and people who have a lot of power and money and, and learning how to speak to them, learning how to describe and, and, uh, communicate very difficult situations to them because you're kind of put in a weird position where you're in charge of their safety, right? So they expect you to be able to like uh, kind of sh- like guide them on certain things or? Yeah. Well, so yeah, so when I was running the uh, a detail for this billionaire, he saw me as his security advisor right? Like we would have these meetings, we would go over all the stuff, we'd talk about his daughters, we would talk about uh, situations with his staff that had happened. And I'm managing his security detail. They're putting a lot of trust in you, just like, just like, uh, you know, young NCOs have in the military, you're, you're young, 20, 20, 20 year old, 19 year old corporal, and you're in charge of a fire team or you're in charge of a squad. So uh, the details at GDBA were very similar, yeah. except now you're in charge of a team, but you're also in charge of this billionaire security program. Yeah, this asset, this principle, it's like, you know, that's uh, more more than like being responsible for like setting up a working party or like, you know, going on, <laughs> maybe going on a patrol. This guy's like, oh, I got, you know, we're going to. Yeah fly my billions of dollars or whatever um that's that's a that's a hefty responsibility that's for sure yeah you mentioned uh interesting question like how do you deal with stress and you know for me i didn't i didn't really i would say having obviously having outlets is important but it wasn't until i really found I, I really didn't start becoming successful until I started dropping a lot of the hobbies that I had and making work my hobby, like finding, finding joy in what you do, especially when it makes you money. Yeah. But oh, that that's fucking tough to do, dude. Because it is. You got to think about like, if it's something, it seems like you enjoyed though, working for your Gavin DeBecker. I did. You know, it's I, like, I, if somebody's became, got like a, it became part of my identity. Right. It, it, you, you take pride, like a lot of details. There's, there's a lot of different clients, right. And, and clients have different preferences with how you tie into their lives. Some clients want you to be a ninja. They never want to see you. They just like knowing that you're going to be around when something bad happens. Right. You're like a seatbelt, right. You don't help them drive the car at all, but if something happens, you're there and you do your job. Other clients like you to be so involved that you're like going on hikes with them. You're going on bike rides with them. You're taking their kids to school. You're going grocery shopping for them. You're running errands. You're everything, anything and everything. And then you become almost like a companion for them I was gonna say like a part of their fucking family dude you know if you're doing that that's pretty that's pretty in depth yeah I mean I've 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 taken clients to Disneyland and Magic Mountain and I've gone to the beach with them and I've 
you know, been in the ocean with their kids, watching them. I've been, uh, I've, I've traveled on private jets and I've gone to shows and everything like I've been their shadow. Right. And, and depending on the client, you know, you, you, you start to become, you start to take on this identity of like a bodyguard and you're just this quiet professional who takes pride and is super aware of his surroundings constantly just paying attention to detail and you could either throw yourself into your career and become that or you can be counting down the hours every day until you get off so that you can go do whatever you ever really want to do and every industry has both types and everything in between too you have people that kind of like their job and they they enjoy it to a certain extent but they also kind of hate it also at times and then you have people that that's their identity and they love it and that's their purpose they find purpose in what they do and you have people that hate it and they don't last very long or something right. bad happens well that and, that's the yeah. that's the key word that purpose is the key word and i think yeah. that obviously giving you um you know it sounds like that that gave you a sense of purpose mm-hmm. um but did that sense of purpose like shift and transition into what you're doing now like you obviously are able to um sustain yourself by you know starting the business business that you've started and yeah. um you know it all started with making a couple small pouches and you know if uh you know give give everybody an idea of like that path that you've gone on to get where you are now at tracer tactical mm-hmm. Right. So obviously finding purpose in your life is extremely important. And I would say that is really the foundation of any success in any industry that that you are in, because if you can find your purpose, then your purpose is basically your own why. If you can explain to yourself why you're doing something and you believe in that why, that's your purpose. Yeah. And we have several identities as men. We're fathers, we're husbands, we're providers, and then we're whatever else we're, we're in between. So, you know, I build gear for a living now. Um, I left GDBA last year and I joined a company uh, that was a smaller consulting firm that was mainly focused on the tech side of things, smaller security firm, uh, I worked for them for 11 months, but I'm still, you know, Tracer is speeding up. Tracer yeah. is starting. Oh, yeah. Huge. Bigger, dude. bigger, bigger. <laughs> so I was like, uh, by the end of actually by summer of last year, I was like, okay, things are starting to change. That's when I started really looking at when am I going to make that jump? When am I going to take Tracer full time? And for the last three years, I started Tracer a little over three years ago. And obviously I'm holding down a full-time job while doing it. Tracer started out as a little hobby. I never, never started it with the intent to turn this thing full-time. I never in a million years thought this would be full-time. I just wanted to make some cool stuff and use it, really. I was making stuff for myself at the time. And then I started making stuff for other people. And when I found that other people wanted what I was making, then I just took it from one project to the next. And I started pushing myself, what can I make next? What can I make next? What, how do I fill, how do I make something that doesn't exist yet? Or how can I improve on something that already does, but maybe isn't checking the boxes? So while I'm doing this, I'm working a full-time job. I'm obviously a father and a husband, and I got to be dad after I get off work until my kids go to bed. And then when my kids go to bed, it's either I'm exhausted, I'm going to sleep and I start my day all over again, but then I lose out an entire day of doing anything that has to do with Tracer Tactical. Or I can push through and work from like nine o'clock at night till two or three in the morning and then shut it down get a few hours of sleep, wake up and start it all over again. 
And I did oh, that for three years almost. That's that's tough, dude. That's that is tough. So fuck, what was the stress like on that? I mean, like how you're did you have doubts in yourself that you were going to be able to successfully pull off this tracer tactical thing? Was it like getting to a point where you're like, fuck, the juice isn't worth the squeeze? Or I mean, how did that ever happen? Um so I I I think one of the reasons why I didn't really experience a lot of stress in that respect was because one, I was still very, I, my, my identity, the, the, the identity that I had was a security consultant and building tactical gear. I mean, I was a designer before I was designing gear. I was designing security systems. I was designing security programs for these people. And I took a lot of that stuff that I learned from those careers and was able to kind of spin it into what I do now. But I never had that expect, I never put that expectation on myself that this has to work. Like Tracer is gonna fail because it was always just gravy. You know, it wasn't my, it wasn't my, but you weren't leaning on Tracer Tactical. It, it wasn't like a, it was more of a hobby for you that it started off that way. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, obviously, it started producing additional income, but it wasn't something that we relied on. Gotcha. So it never there was never that pressure to make it work. The pressure's on now. Yeah, obviously. I was going to say before it was like, yeah, maybe I could just take another day or two to finish this play carrier, or this chest yeah. rig, you know, and like now you're like, fuck, I had to fill all these orders. The, the pressure is on. And uh, but one thing I will say is that it's odd. You would think that transitioning to this full time, it would be even more stressful. It's actually been less stressful because I was working basically two jobs for three years, getting zero sleep and like just surviving on caffeine every day, you know, and being a zombie the first few hours of the day, neglecting my health, um, just tuned out from my family, zoned out because I'm so tired and I'm, I got all these other things I'm worried about with my job and everything on the line. Okay, so that that that's a good uh, segue into because I I'm kind of, you know, been experiencing something similar, and I know a lot of people are in this position where you've got an endeavor that you want to take, um, and you've got the ability to to run with it, right? Like, what were you thinking about, you know, with transitioning from the career that you've created for yourself, um, you know, within working with GBA and you know the the other firm. How how was that step into um how was that step into the next realm uh like mentally hurdle like through family like the decisions that you made how did you get to that point where you're like I need to take this take this next step yeah um I mean obviously I was praying about it a lot um it was something that I. I thought about it for several months before pulling the trigger. Like it's very, very scary when you have a career. Uh, I've been doing this for, you know, over a decade and I've built up a very nice salary and I'm about to throw all that out the window. Yeah. Right. Like leave it all behind and take a chance. Um, you know, and there's a lot of things that that I that I kept thinking about, like the whole burn burn the ships mentality. Like once you get to the island, burn it because you're not, you're not going back. Yeah. So so in in the book, uh, there's a reference in uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill where he talks about burning the boats. And so like the captain, you know, they invade an island and they're about to take over this island. And the captain tells the the guys to burn the ships because like retreat is not an option. You have to you have to make that commitment. Um, and so like part of part of making that commitment was 
taking both feet and jumping in, like not having one foot in the water, like don't have, you're never going to get anywhere if you half-ass it, right? Like full commitment into it. And there's actually a really good scene in uh, The Dark Knight Rises when he is climbing out of that pit and he's trying to make that jump. He's climbing up with the rope around him, right? He's trying to make that jump. And he's, he keeps failing. And he asked the guy, like, how did, how did he make it? Like, how did he make that jump? And the guy tells him, you have to take off the rope. Like that clicked, that clicked in me when I, when I saw that scene and I saw it during, I, I rewatched it. There was a, it was actually really funny. I was actually getting my hair cut and that scene was on. This is while I was still working for uh, the other company. And I was like debating, when am I going to do this? When am I going to, when am I going to make that jump? And I saw that scene and it was like, there's day. Like, that was the sign needed. Like you have to take the rope off if you're going to make that jump. Because if you take the rope off, then there's, there's you're no not, off. you're not going back. You're, there's, you, you you're removing fail. the safety net, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like you're going to commit 100% and make that jump or you're going to die. <laughs> right? Like, if, like in that scene, if he took, if he, he fail, if he fell, if he didn't, if he didn't make the jump with that rope off, he would have fell to his death. Yeah. Right. So one having that mentality where it's like failure is not an option, but you also have to be smart about it. Okay. I'm not saying like, don't be calculating or strategic but it's a mental commitment of that of like hey i'm committed to this and i'm i'm giving all of myself to do this right i know what you're um, saying you know another good one is like if you're going to go it's like you're you're trying to cross a freeway right and you're just waiting for traffic to clear you're not going to just if someone says just go just go well you're not going to just go because you're going to get you're going to get smashed by a car right you kind of know when's the right time to go and you're, you see an opening. You're like, okay, I think I can make it. Obviously there's little things in your life that will little clues, little indicators, you know, that will, that will help you make a decision like that. Obviously your finances have to be good. Things have to be good with your family. You got to have your wife's support. Um, you got to be ready to go. Like, you know, obviously we were rolling already. I already had, I was already doing it. You know, it wasn't like I was starting this endeavor. I wasn't quitting my job and then trying this thing. Right, right, right. I'd already been doing it for a long time. I mean, not a long time, but. You yeah, know, a couple of three years. Yeah, three years, years is a, enough time to get yourself comfortable where you understand what you're doing and the equipment that you have and the gear that you need. And you're not just like, oh, well, oh, yeah. shit. Oh, I don't have this material. I don't have this, but yep. you know, you knew what you were like doing. I, I knew, I knew I was confident enough to know that I could make it work. And, and what kind of yeah. things did like, you know, you, you speak of confidence, what kind of things previously like showed that to be, um, you know, I don't know if it's support from your family or uh, something that you did, created, sold, the feedback that you got, what gave you that confidence to know that like this was the right decision to make? Uh, I would say when the scout rig started picking up sales, I developed, I designed the scout rig a year before it got popular. And the, a year before I actually took tracer full time sales were not great. It was, it was, uh, basically like an extra paycheck, you know, every month, it wasn't a lot of money, especially after like costs of goods and, you know, um, material and the margins and weren't all huge. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, you got to buy all that stuff and I'd purchase machines and obviously you're investing time. And so like margins weren't super great, but 
it wasn't until I started having some feedback from people that I respected. And then uh, some of my designs started catching the eyes of military units. When military units started contacting me saying, hey, can we try out these prototypes? Can you send us samples? Hey, we would like to try out this rig. Um, and that was like with the whole plate bags, you know, the removable plate bags, the scout rigs, the system that I kind of developed that was very modular. You could add armor to a chest rig and turn a chest rig into a plate carrier. But you're rig. right, right. And when some SOCOM units started approaching me and asking for if they could if they could test them and then buy them, that's when I was like, okay, I've got something here. Like this is something that is it's not a little tiny lockpick pouch. Like this is granted, you could make a lot of money if you if you with the right marketing and the right uh, you know customer base you know and like yeah like you could, you could yeah you could design something really really tiny and sell millions of them right but the thing that i had that i had designed was expensive uh but it was starting to be sought after from specialized units right and so it's gonna feel pretty good when they're coming to you and like have the ability for all these different companies out there and we could you know say like you know obviously velocity systems and you yeah. know whoever it may be eagle blackhawk all the and you're like oh dude these guys want to buy my chest rig like that's that's mm -hmm. pretty fucking sweet you know yeah and i and it's yeah that was it was super exciting obviously game changing uh i bent over backwards to you know get these guys that kit and I was giving away money, essentially, like giving these units free samples and, hey, try this, give me your feedback. And I, you know, I'd spend six hours building this rig myself, you know, and, and then giving it away, like giving away my baby, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. You know, just it's it's not like I'm getting these things uh, for free. And then, you know, it's uh, it's my time invested, like every stitch. I built that thing, every single thing. Um, and it, it was hard. It, it's uh, and I know a lot of businesses that can't do that. Like, they're just like, I can't give away that stuff. I was in a unique position because it wasn't my, wasn't my full-time. Right. Your day. main source was, of income. It was a hobby at that point still that was making some extra money. And I, it hurt giving away that stuff, but you just gotta you're just it's kind of like a farmer planting seeds you know you're just you gotta sow your seeds and then eventually you, you reap the harvest you know like you uh you're kind of taking a chance and you gotta make you know you're there's gonna be there's gonna be projects and and uh you're gonna give away a lot of gear to people that maybe not they don't like it or it's just you know well it seems like the you the decision to do so and the obviously having that confidence in yourself and it benefited you paid off. I would hope that it had paid yeah. off to got you where you are today. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I would say baby steps for sure. It, it wasn't like I started seeing success like fast. It took a, it took, I was grinding for two and a half years before it really started picking up. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I remember, um, you know, cause obviously again, through most of the people that I meet, um, it's either through mutual friend or somebody that I follow on Instagram. And <clears throat> I'm pretty sure from the first time that I'd started following you, you had like 7,000 followers and now oh, you're wow. up to like, now you're up to like 60 something thousand. I'm pretty sure. And that like to yeah. see that over the, you know, over that period of time is pretty wild. And, you know, the, the gear that's coming out and my buddy actually just bought uh, a whole kit from a whole setup from you the other day. Uh, nice. I'll have him on here. Eventually he's a good friend of mine. He served with second battalion, fourth Marines. He lost the, uh, just stepped on a pressure plate in Afghanistan, but a uh, really good dude. But um, yeah, everybody loves your gear, man. Uh, I know a lot of people like Blake's out there. He's, if you got a guy like him repping your gear, that, uh, you know, that sends a lot of people your in your direction. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. And then that's, I mean, that's kind of where I've found 
you know, my new purpose is one, giving, giving guys who are going to be relying on this equipment potentially in a life or death situation, um, making sure that I'm putting out quality stuff and also just pushing the envelope with new ideas, new products, um, trying to plug the holes in the market, right? Because it would be easy for me to design just another mag pouch, right? Or here's another GP pouch. Here is another plate flat carrier. pack or something. Anything. Yeah. Um, you know, there's obviously there's uh, there is gear that is inspired by other products, but I'm constantly trying to to come up with something that's going to be just a little bit better. And like when someone makes something, maybe someone takes some inspiration from me and designs something better than something I have. Obviously, your first instinct is to be a little pissed off, like, oh man, he copied I, me. I did that. Yeah. You know, like you... you're taking something that I designed and now you're copying me. But I mean, there's a good, there's a good uh there's a good video on uh, YouTube where this guy, I think it's a TED talk. It's like nothing new, like every it's called everything's a repeat. And there's nothing like basically there's nothing new under the sun, right? Like everyone copies everyone. Yeah. Or it's, everything is a remix. Well, it's like fuck, it dude. And it's also the other thing, like too, like you can only go so far with the capabilities that we have with tactical gear, whether it's a mm -hmm. fucking split rig or a plate carrier. How many different style pouches are you gonna have? Like, is it gonna be Velcro? Is it gonna clip? Is it gonna be yep. a bungee? Is it gonna be a zipper? You know, there's there's only so many ways you can really go with right. it. Is it gonna sit sideways? It'll mount at 45 degrees or but it's it's just a new spin on it or having mm -hmm. an alternate pouch connected to it or you know like something for a multi-tool or a magazine pouch or whatever it may be um yeah. but it is pretty cool to see the constant change and in innovation of being able to adapt and uh you know like mutate from mm -hmm. the original ideas of where they came yeah and 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 that's probably the stuff that i enjoy the most is when I get a lot of ideas and a lot of feedback from like followers on Instagram. Like yeah. they'll DM me and they'll be like, Hey, what if you did this? Or you know, what would be cool is this. And it's actually like a legit idea. So I try to listen to that because if it's, if someone's asking for something, there's a probably a good chance that other people, could, other people are going to yes. want it too. Right? right. If one person's thinking of it, then I guarantee you that other people have thought of it. Yeah. And, and so I do listen to that feedback. It's important to, especially end users who are, you know, doing a lot of training. Um, I'm starting to work more directly with military units and law enforcement units. And I really love talking to those guys when it comes to designing gear, because they're using it for their job on a daily basis. Right. And some of the best feedback comes from those guys, but well, it's cool to see that you engage with, I mean, obviously how you and I were able to get connected so easily, you know, it's like, it's, it's awesome to see that the people that you like repping and supporting the things that they're doing, you find out that they're a genuinely good person as well. So it makes it even more worthwhile of, mm -hmm. you know, putting that out there and, and buying those products. So I'm glad that, uh, you know, you have a, a good mindset about it and you've worked your ass off and a lot of time and effort into where you've gotten today. And I think that's one of the biggest things to show is after, you know, regardless of your experience through time and service, you can always find a career path that can correlate or make you feel like you've found some purpose. And then through that, you know, like you've got yourself this hobby um, and, and you completely took that, ran with it, uh, took a bet, a big bet on yourself and leaving that career behind. And, you know, mm -hmm. through all those steps, uh, it didn't happen overnight. And here you are, and now you've got like a pretty successful business where you're creating gear that's utilized by, um, you know, military units and law enforcement units, and they're out there doing the job. So if yeah. your gear is holding up for them, then it'll definitely be, you know, good enough for somebody like me that, you know, goes in the range once a month or twice a month and runs some drills and stuff. So, yeah, I, I've enjoyed getting back into this community because I've been out of it for such a long time. So uh, 
finding finding the purpose in this community that's filled with veterans and shooters and guys who just enjoy training and uh, who are into this gear, like into gear and into shooting. It's obviously a lot of my equipment is based around that, like almost nearly all of it, aside yeah. from like lock picking and stuff like that. But even that, uh, we're doing, we did some pouches for a lot of the scout snipers lock because their lock picking is now part of the urban uh, sniper course. So, you know, we sent some lockpick pouches to some of the Marine snipers who were learning how to lockpick. Um, but I would say that is probably one of the aspects I've enjoyed the most of starting this business and, and then doing this for a living now is being able to just talk with veterans on a daily basis, guys who I served with, you know, way back when uh not even having to be in the same unit but just guys who were in when i was in and how the you know talking about how the military is changing and and also talking with guys who are active duty uh i talk i talk with a lot of guys who are still serving and you know even guys that are deployed right now and their feedback is something that i value uh tremendously yeah. so just being able to do that uh, is very fulfilling you know on a daily basis is uh is waking up and just being able to go tinker um yeah it seems like it's a good creative outlet too i mean it's a good way to engage sure. with people and obviously yeah. like you're you're doing something that you're passionate about and i think that's a a big thing that goes into really any of this stuff is finding something that you're passionate about and you know like can make a make a living with doing you got to take a yeah take a chance in yourself um but yeah you know, obviously I'm, I would say I would say that as a a husband and a father and just you know we as men will tolerate a shitty job to provide for our families. Yes. And yeah. and that is a very that is a very noble thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh I feel I feel lucky that I've been able to find something that I enjoy but at the end of the day I would still work a job that I hated if it was providing for my family. You know, that is that is the number one priority for me is to provide for my kids and my wife. And, you know, I, I I've had to learn how to shut it down. You know, at the end of the day, I could work 24-7. There is an there's enough work to keep me busy forever. And I would never get ahead of it. So if you are a family guy, you have to pull the plug at some balance. point. Yeah. yeah. And so what I was talking about earlier, I didn't really get to uh, kind of go down that, but taking this business full time has allowed me to become a better husband and a better father because now I'm sleeping again and I'm now I'm my own boss, right? The only people, I mean, kind of, Kind of. So there's still obviously I, I, I'm I'm serving. I am creating something for somebody else. Somebody is paying me to build them something. Right. So I'm I am at their service. But. Nobody is telling me, hey, you need to jump on the Zoom call or, hey, if you don't do this, we're going to you're going to lose your job. Right. We're right. Going to fire you. It, having that that freedom has been a game changer. For me. It's, you know what I, I that's crazy to think about because now i know why like the lead times change on all these gear companies when they're making custom gear it's because they're like fuck it i'm not sewing anything for the next two weeks and <laughs> i'm gonna push push well, i haven't done times. that yet <laughs> <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding i'm I kidding I'm, I'm, I'm... yeah i haven't it's not like i'm taking a bunch of vacations and 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 you know you're waiting because i'm out playing i'm I am working every day as fast as I can. But oh, I'm sure that's, when, I, I couldn't, I would, I don't even know the process that it's got to take to go behind being able yeah. to do all that. And it, it's, I'm sure that you, you work really hard behind doing that yeah. stuff. I mean, a lot of it, if people are curious about it, it's, it's a lot of it is just batching, right? That's probably why things take a long time. Sometimes if you order something really special, um, you know, the machines are threaded with a certain color for maybe a couple of days because we're working on something that's black and or multi-cam black. We try to batch colors with 
you know, when you're, when the machines are threaded a certain color, you try to knock out the different colors. And, or if you're running the laser, you're cutting a specific thing. It's easier to focus on one thing and get it done than it is to bounce around and try to do a, a bunch of different things at, a, at different times. Right. You know? I feel you. So. That's, that's understandable. Um, but uh, do, do you feel that you found like, you know, uh, you're calling a little happiness. Like, obviously you've already explained that you have, you got the time with the family yeah. now, make your own schedule. Um, and it seems like you're able to, I mean, make a successful living off of something that you're passionate about. Yeah. I would say, I would say that I just enjoy building stuff. Who knows what the future, you know, holds. Uh, I I'm enjoying building this stuff currently um i could i could probably do this until i die you know nice. and be happy nice. i it's fun to me it's uh especially the purpose of designing gear for like the next generation of war fighters you know definitely uh, like that, that is that, that itself that's pretty cool right there to see that guys will be utilizing your gear taking it onto the next level yeah i mean i i i I used really shitty gear when I was active duty. Oh, you know, I, geez, I can, <laughs> like, like I was using when we got to eighth and I, I was issued uh, the LBVs, old school woodland LBVs, you know, with the canted like button mag pouches. I know, like, I know what you're talking about. I'm like the, and and the draw like, strings dry, on the sides, tricolor, tricolor fucking camos, like the woodland, uh, yeah, M81, yeah. I mean, I was the last cycle to get issued woodlands, but I, and then I was using the like flak jackets from like Vietnam. Yeah. Nice. The, the interceptor, like the one and they like the buttons would click like the snap, snap up buttons. Yep. With the collar, the big collars yep. <laughs> yeah. and the well, shoulder pads. <laughs> um, I always ask, I always ask the guys, um, you know, even in, in any aspect of their service during time, like you obviously join, um, you know, the Marine Corps uh you know because of 9 11 or i would assume that you know joining in december of 2001 that's yeah. part of the reason why um you know through the culmination of the gwat and everything that's happened you know and you being involved in it in the way that you were uh seeing the things that you did and obviously experiencing uh from start to finish what if there's one word that you could use to describe the gwat like what would that be one word. Man, that is tough. It is. I'm trying to think like, am I describing it? from my perspective or am I describing it from like the country's perspective? Your, your perspective, what you think, what I think of the G watt, the whole G watt thing. Yeah. One, one word. Man. I'd have to say hmm. it's always a tough one. Dang. Like when I first joined. I would, the feeling, the whole overall feeling was, it was like, maybe revenge is, is too aggressive, but I felt that I felt, I felt when I joined like obviously because of like 9-11, like yeah, the Pentagon, I, the Twin I, Towers. I, I, I'd say uh, – like, 
like a like a word that describes the way I felt. And one of the things that called me was like payback. Yeah. Right. And I think that's a good word, too, because. As a young man who joins the Marine Corps during a time of war. Which was a 20 year long war. The word payback can be used in several ways. One, it's like revenge, right? So you're getting you're you're giving payback, but you're also giving payback to your country too. And I would say that there is no there is almost no bigger purpose for especially a young a young man than to become a warrior like there has been since the beginning of time obviously warriors in every culture in every century um and that is like the ultimate and that's why so many Marines and service members, especially, you know, those with, you know, combat MOSs, they struggle to find that transition because you're, you're experiencing like peak purpose when you're serving. Yeah. Even when you're doing, even when you're doing the dumb shit, right. But But there is, there is like, you know, that the, the Bible verse that comes to my mind is, uh, is, you know, the one love has no greater than one, than those man lay down his life for his brothers, friends. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's hard to put that into one word, like saying, saying the word love, describing it as love doesn't really translate, but and neither does sacrifice. Like sacrifice doesn't describe the GWAT, right? But there is a feeling, a sense of, of duty and honor of being able to just lay it out on the line and, and go to war with your brothers. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, I never got to experience that. But, and I would say this to anyone who joined during the GWAP period is you laid it all out on the line. Like even yeah, like, now, like with the expectation of possibility of possibly going to fulfill that. Right. Like, that's yeah. what you're saying. Like you, you, you were in the, you know, the thought of this could be, you know, me getting to go serve in combat or like what, whatever. I, I, I get what you're saying. You don't, the unknown, it's the unknown. Yeah, right? definitely. And so when you are willing to, when you are willing to uh, lay it all out on the line and, and potentially give up your life or give up a quality of life that you may otherwise have had if you hadn't joined. I mean, guys who are wounded in combat, their lives are changed forever. Yeah. The quality of their life, the experience of their, of their life is now altered because they made a decision to go serve. I think the one now I'm now I'm kind of honing in on the word and I think the word that I would choose to describe it all would be selflessness. Well, the the individuals that like make that selfless decision to join the military during a time of yep. war. Yeah. Yep. They are they are putting they are putting something bigger than themselves. You know, they are they are putting themselves aside and and doing something that is bigger than themselves yeah and that's why it's so hard for so many guys to uh, to transition from that because it's like the ultimate purpose for a man is to go off and fight that's when he becomes a man right that's like a rite of passage you know and for many of us that's when we became men was when we were in the marine corps we were or we were serving that's when we became men yeah you know and so but to to describe the GWAP period 
you're you're joining knowing that you could potentially get deployed and go and go fight and potentially die or or right. have your have your life seriously altered um and so i would say i would say selflessness for sure that's a good one i like it that's a and it's a it's a positive i mean insight look at it because a lot of people will you know talk about betrayal and um you know confusion and lies and everything which is you know not that is true but um to show that side of you know a different perspective of thinking that everybody that signed on the dotted line during that point in time was willing to ultimately pay with their lives and uh it's an important yeah. thing to it's an important thing to take note of but uh, but on that note i think we've been we've been at it for about two hours maybe a little over two hours now um we've gotten some good insight on the way that you know you've been able to successfully transition out and you know deal with some of the things that you've gone through and um uh, good insight and mentorship and leadership and getting out and advocating for yourself and being able to put yourself in the position that you're in now and be successful at where you're at. So, um, Aaron, I, I'm very fortunate that I got you on here because I think there's people out there that definitely need to hear the possibilities that you can take advantage of, you know, if you're, if you're willing to do it and you've been somebody that has, you know, showed resilience in that fact. And there you are now. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel extremely lucky and and I got to earn it every day. You know, it's uh, it's it's really not what you did yesterday is what you do today. And and, uh, you know, I feel blessed to be able to wake up every day and try again. Hell yeah, dude. So every day is an opportunity. And uh, I would say you you get out what you put into it, no matter what, no matter what you're doing. And uh, just find your purpose. Yeah, that's the that's the big thing. That purpose right there. Finding what you're good at and what motivates you and drives you to keep on keeping on, keep pressing mm -hmm. forward. Um, but yeah, dude, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy, and obviously you got a personal life too. So um, you know, anything uh, anything you need in the future, any feedback or whatever, I'm looking forward to seeing some new gear that you're going to be coming out with. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And, uh, hope to, uh, talk to you guys again soon. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll see you around. I'll be, I'll be following <laughs> along, but, uh, yeah, thanks again, man. So guys, that was a pressing forward podcast with Aaron Snyder, the United States Marine and the owner of tracer tactical check out the scout rig and I'll be posting his Instagram and the, uh, on the video and make sure you guys follow along and check out what he's up to. Thanks for tuning in. See ya.